So, hi everyone again. Welcome back. Uh, so, last time, back on the distant past of last Thursday, we, of course, covered the famous Shaw's algorithm. Which is this very, very famous algorithm invented by Peter Shaw back in early 90s that gives you an exponential speed up using a quantum computer over the sort of current best known um, classical algorithms. And the sort of the most famous version of it is, is, is an algorithm for factoring primes. It's, you know, it's broader than that, right? Any, any time where you're estimating the period of, you can convert the problem into estimating the period of a function or, or to doing phase estimation, um, then you can, you know, apply a version of Shaw's algorithm to solve it. But it's really a pretty limited set of problems where you can do that. Um, so today, we're going to cover the other of the two famous quantum algorithms. There really aren't terribly many of them. They're hard to come up with, uh, which is Grover Search. And uh, in some ways, this is less impressive than Shaw's algorithm, in some ways more. Uh, it only gives a quadratic speed up over the classical um, approach. So if the classical approach takes time n, then the quantum one will still take time square root of n rather than like something polynomial in log n, as for Shaw's algorithm. Um, but it can be applied to a much larger class of problems. Like with yeah, a, a significant fraction of classical algorithms and the, any classical algorithm that involves searching, so sort of exhaustive search of a space of possibilities or something like that, you can, you can apply Grover search to and get some sort of speed up for a quantum computer. Of course, the question of, of whether uh, we'll ever have large enough, fast enough quantum computers that at a quadratic speed up is actually enough to uh, outcompete the classical computers with their, their huge amount of, of memory and bits and like processing power and like classical logic gates and so on is a, an open question. Um, so it's not clear it will actually be valuable ever, but um, certainly there is a formal scaling advantage. Okay, so that's, that's the plan. Um, so we should start by just sort of defining what the problem with Grover search is. Um, and obviously, as I say, it can be applied to some huge class of problem, but in its most pure form, it's a, a query complexity problem. Okay, again, we have some, some black box Oracle as with many of our earlier simpler algorithms. And we're trying to learn something about that black box oracle while calling it as few times as possible, OK? And in this case, that oracle is conventionally defined as what's called a phase oracle, which I'm going to write as u minus 1 to the f. And the action of this phase operator on some state x in the computational basis is that it takes x to minus 1 to the f of x times x. OK, so this is a little different from the, the usual sort of oracle we define, right? So normally, we would define. Um, what we can call uf for some function f, which takes x and some additional. So I should say f of x is going to go from um, yeah, this is going to be equal to either 0 or 1. OK, it, it's, it's going to be a map from, from an n bit number x to a, a single bit, either 0 or 1. Um, so normally we would define, if we had some function like that, we'd say the quantum analog 
is a map that takes you n qubits x and a single extra qubit y, and it maps it to x y plus f of x, right? Um, if we have an oracle like this, okay, it's very simple to, to sort of convert it into a phase oracle. They're pretty much equivalent sources of information about f of x. Uh, so how do we do that? It's very simple. We do apply uf to x tensored with the minus state, okay? And it's easy to check, you know, this is, this is basically what we did in Dodge's problem. Example that this is exactly the same thing as u is the phase oracle acting on x, and then the minus state just stays unchanged, right? This is just because if f of x equals one, then uh, uh, the zero goes to in the, the minus qubit, then zero goes to one and one goes to zero, and that just applies a phase to the minus state. Okay. So this is a slightly different formal um, oracle, formal black blocks source of information about the function f of x um, to the one to the, the, the ones that we're more familiar with, but it's really pretty equivalent as a source of information. Okay. And for simplicity, at least for the moment. I'm going to assume that there's some x naught such that f of x naught is equal to one, and f of any x not equal to x naught is equal to zero. Okay, so this function f picks out a single element x naught. And our goal from the Grover search algorithm is going to be just to find x naught. Okay. So hopefully that's clear. And hopefully it's also clear that this is a you know very general purpose, powerful thing to do. You know, this this if, if you could do it efficiently, um, you know, this thing, yeah, lets us. It's it's searching for the single element that, that returns a positive answer, right? To some some function call. Could you okay. quickly explain what you meant by this note? Uh, I think I, I just missed that. Uh, in the middle yeah. Of the so page. so the point is that normally in our, our previous algorithms, rather than having this thing I've called u minus one to the f, which applies this phase of f of x is equal to one, we instead talked about this this function u f that basically leaves x unchanged and then adds f of x to this ancilla qubit, right? This extra qubit that was initially in the state y, okay? And what I'm saying is that if you can do that u of f, then you can also effectively do u of minus one to the f, um, can implement u minus one to the f using uf and the way you do that is you just apply uf to the state you want to apply it to you you want to apply u minus one to the f to uh tensored with the minus state okay and because the the you know, if f of x equals zero then Sort of minus the minus state goes to the minus state. If f of x is equal to one, then the minus state, yeah, you know, the zero goes to one and the one goes to zero, but that just changes the minus state by phase. Okay, so the 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 only effect of this u of f is to apply a phase um, if uh, f of x is equal to one, which is exactly what we wanted. U minus one to the F to the. Is that clear? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. So our goal is to find this single element X naught, um, which has F of X naught equal to one. Okay. And it should be pretty clear that classically, any algorithm to do this is going to need to do order big N called 
of f of x, right? Because um, the only way you can find f x naught is if you happen to call x naught. Um, and on average, that's going to take you at least n over two calls. Um, yeah, you might get lucky occasionally, but on average, that's, that's what's going to happen. So back in the 1990s, there was sort of an open question that was clearly an important question of, um, you know, we'd found all these, these exponential feet. Yeah, n, n equals two to the little n number of possible values of x, just to answer the question in the chat. OK, so back in the 1990s, there was sort of a natural question, which is, can we get an exponential quantum speed up for this task? OK, so we'd found a load of things where there were. Uh, this is the thing that takes an exponential time in little n classically. Um, is this possible in p of little n, which is polynomial in log of big n, right? That would be an exponential speed up. You could do this. This would be sort of true. You know, this this would be the true spirit of of the pop sci idea that quantum computers just try everything at once and then find the right answer, right? Um, quantum parallelism, because it would be some something that lets you, you know, there's exponentially many possibilities and it would let you find the right one in a, a polynomial time. Okay. So this would have been a huge deal, but in 1997, uh, Bennett, Brassard, I think both on this, Fazerani is the V, I forget what the last B is. Um, but they proved a theorem that there is, in fact, this isn't possible. There's no quantum algorithm that can do this. In less than order square root n calls. OK, and we'll see at the end of the lecture the sort of rough intuition of how this, this proof works. Um, but really, at the time, as I understand it, they basically thought, OK, that's done. Just quantum computers don't help with this problem. Um, they just assumed that the square root was just some, some sort of technical issue. But really, the answer was the quantum computers couldn't speed up at all. You know, if they couldn't do an exponential speed up, then they probably really couldn't really do anything. And this was just a matter of like finding a proof that there was really a lower bound um, that was order n. OK. Um, but then just a few months later, Grover came out, so this was still in 1997, big deal year in the, the history of quantum search. And he said, actually, no, this lower bound of order square root, and you know, there was a reason you had that square root. It's because uh, solving the problem with order square root n calls is achievable after all. OK, so how oops. How does Grover's algorithm work? Well, it's pretty simple. It's going to use two unitaries. It's going to be key to it. The first is u minus one to the f, okay? 
which we can write for this simple case, just as the identity minus two times the projector onto x naught, right? Has an eigenstate of minus one, that's x naught, and all the other eigenstates are equal to one. Second operator, unitary operator, which you can call D. It's a bit weird, it's not called anything involving U, but this is the conventional thing. It's called D for the diffusion operator. Again, I didn't really get that name, but um, it's the name that's used. It's gonna be the following operator. It's gonna be pretty simple, similar. It's gonna be two times the tensor product of n copies of the plus state, i.e. the state you get from Hadamarding n zeros minus the identity matrix. Okay, so what this does is if you're in, if the state is a tensor product of n plus states, uh, then it leaves the state unchanged. If it's orthogonal to that, then it applies a phase of minus one. Okay, so we want to check that we can actually implement D efficiently. Um, you know, for query complexity question, this isn't a problem, but eventually we want to use this algorithm to, to efficiently do things with efficient circuit complexity. So we don't want our overhead in how many uh, Ds we need to apply to be too big, how many gates we need to apply to, to implement D. Um, Unfortunately, D is a pretty simple thing to implement, right? So, uh, yeah, we don't really care about an overall phase of minus one. That's that's not physical. Um, so we can also think of this as, as you know, it's basically the same unitary as as minus D. Um, it just applies a phase of minus one if uh, the state is a tensor product of of n plus states. Okay. But that's sort of not a thing we normally think about doing. So let's instead imagine doing it by Hadamarding everything. So that takes all plus states to all zero states. But even all zero states, we, we don't normally uh, think about applying a phase conditioned on that. Um, so let's then apply an X gate to everything that takes all zero states to all one states. And now what we're wanting to do is just apply a phase of minus one if the, the qubits are all in the state one. Okay, does anyone know the gate that would do that? Apply a phase of minus one if, if and only if every single, um, every single, every single uh, qubit is in the state one. Well, what would it be if it was two qubits? Well, that's just a controlled Z gate, right? It's if the first qubit is one, then if the second qubit is also one, then it applies a phase of minus one. Okay, so this is just a, a Z gate controlled on N minus one qubits. That's a pretty simple thing to implement, right? We saw how to efficiently implement controlled, uh, multi-controlled gates. Um, so we can do that. And so we've now applied a phase if it's in the, the or one state, and now we just have to convert the all one state back into the uh, all plus state. So we apply a product of n's and then a product of h's. Okay. So that was all just a side thing of just a, a practical algorithm for implementing this D. But the key point is this is just a, a simple, pretty simple operator to apply, right? Um, yeah. This is something we can do efficiently. I'm sorry, can you repeat one more time why it's n minus one for the control Z? Oh, because we have little n qubits in total, right? If it was two qubits, it would just be a control Z. Um, right, so we have we have n qubits in total. The bottom one is having the Z applied to it, um, and all the other ones are controlling it. Okay, but this is just, it's not that the bottom one is, is special, right? The thing about a controlled Z state is it doesn't matter whether the control qubit, target qubit is the bottom one or the top one. Same thing is true here. We could do the, the which one of these we label as the Z and which we label as the N minus one controls is irrelevant. It's the same gate either way. It's just a gate that applies a phase of minus one if they're all equal to one. Okay.
Yeah, thank you. Okay. So then our Grover circuit is going to be really very simple. We're going to start with our qubits all in zero state. As always, we're going to Hadamard them all. Okay, so we now have a superposition of all values of x. Then we're going to apply this phase oracle. Then we're going to apply the diffusion operator. Then we're going to apply the phase oracle. Then we're going to apply the diffusion operator. And then we're just going to keep going. We're just going to keep going, alternating these two operators back and forth. And then eventually, um, we'll see in a minute exactly how long we need to keep going. Um, but the answer is that we need order roughly pi by 4 times square root n. Four, two to the little n over two iterations. Okay. And then eventually we're just going to measure the qubits and we're going to hope that we get x naught. Okay. Is it clear to everyone? Any questions about like, you know, what the algorithm is for? You know, how, how, how the, the, the things it consists of, the gates it consists of? Um, otherwise, I shall go on to explaining why it works. Okay. So is your X not, like, is the output a binary of, like, a binary number? Yeah. And I the X not? Yeah. So, so all, you know, all these, like, uh, you know, where, where, whenever I've been writing X here um, in states, that means a binary representation of x on n qubits. Okay. 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 So let's call this t0, t1, t2, t3, t4, so on. Okay, so t0, we just have all, everything in the zero state. T1, the state is 2 to the minus little n over 2, sum over x, cat x. Okay, that's just the, the usual thing. We're going to write this in a slightly odd way. Going to write it as 2 to the minus n over 2, or 1 over square root n, times x naught. Plus one over square root n minus one over n times some normalized state x naught perp, which is perpendicular to x naught. Okay, so x naught perp here is just equal to one over square root of n minus one times sum over x not equal to x naught of x. Okay, it's just the part of this, this whole state that's orthogonal to x naught. Okay. So now I can just imagine, you know, forget about every state other than x naught and x naught perpendicular. And forget about the fact that the amplitudes can be complex. And I'm just going to draw this as a two-dimensional vector space. So we have x naught perp on the horizontal axis, and we have x naught here on the vertical axis. And our state at time t1 is almost entirely in the x naught perp direction. but it has this small component in the x naught direction, right? One over square root n component in the x naught direction. Okay. And now 
So the next step in our, our algorithm is apply u minus 1 to the f to this state t1. So what does this do? Well, if we applied it to x0, it applies a phase of minus 1 by definition. So it takes x0 to minus x0. What about x0 perp? Anyone tell me what it does to x0 perp? Come on, someone. Nothing. 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 Right. So the, the only state it does anything to is x0. So this just gets stayed unchanged. Awesome. OK. So what does this mean as a, a sort of geometric action? It means this is just a reflection over the horizontal axis. Right. So we can do this. OK, so the x0 component gets flipped. So it goes down here. So time t2, the state looks like this. OK. Now what's the next step? Well, now we need to apply this diffu diffusion operator, d, right? OK, so what does this do? Well, it doesn't do anything nice to either x0 or to uh, um, x0 perp, but d acting on 1 over square root n, x0 plus square root n minus 1 over n times x0 perp, right? That's this whole combination is our original state that's just a superposition over all values of x or equivalently a product of n copies of the plus state. Right. Is that clear to everyone? And what happens to that when we apply the diffusion operator to it? Well, that's the lone eigenstate with eigenvalue plus one with the diffusion operator. So this gets mapped to itself. We could also think about what happens to a state orthogonal to this. So square root of n minus 1 over n times x0 minus square root of 1 over n times x0 perp. OK, so this is the, the, the state with real coefficients, one of the two states with real coefficients in this two-dimensional space that's orthogonal to the original superposition over x. What happens to this state when we apply the diffusion operator to it? Anyone tell me? So the, the diffusion operator has one eigenvalue that's equal to 1, which is all plus states, or superposition over all values of x, and every other eigenvalue has eigenvalue minus 1. So what's going to happen when we plug in this, this combination of x0 and x0 perp? Come on, somebody. You'll get a minus sign. Awesome. So, so by definition, we constructed this to, to be orthogonal to the plus 1 eigenstate of d. And all the other eigenstates of d have eigenvalue minus 1. So this does indeed go to minus itself. So can anyone tell me what this operator does as like a, a geometric action um, on this two dimensional space, right? If u minus one to the x was a, a reflection across the horizontal axis, what's this operator d doing? So it keeps anything in this sort of initial direction, like a point here or something, unchanged. But anything that's like on a line orthogonal to that, so say a point up here, gets mapped to minus itself. It gets mapped to down here. And it's a linear map. So it's just 
a reflection. across the psi t1 axis right the 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 axis defined by an initial state that's just a superposition of all values of x okay is that clear to everyone okay so let's apply um this reflection to our state at time t2. So it gets mirrored across the state at time t1. And it goes to the state at time t3. So it's going to be up here. OK. Does anyone know what the map from the state at time t1 to the state at time t3 looks like the combination of a reflection across the horizontal axis and then a reflection back across this uh, other axis um, at, at, of, of the state at time t1. Anyone know that? What do I get if I compose two reflections across different axes? Some sort of rotation. Awesome. It is indeed some sort of rotation. Anytime you compose two reflections, you always get a rotation. OK. How much is it a rotation by? Well, let's call this angle theta, then this angle is also going to be theta because we just reflect across the horizontal axis. And then when we reflect across the t1 axis, then this has to be 2 theta. So in fact, there's a rotation by 2 theta. What's theta going to be? That we can work out, right? Uh, the the you know the the opposite is one over square root n. Uh, the hypotenuse is one, so theta is just equal to inverse sine of one over square root big n. Big n is generally very large if we have more than two or three qubits. So very high accuracy, we can say that this is roughly equal to one over square root n. So the rotation is by a square root 4 over n, 2 over square root n. OK. Now we just have to iterate. So the, the about this. Yes. Are we making we're making a small angle approximation in that? In yes, formula, that, that's, a, that's a small angle approximation because big N is very large. Uh, so, so we're taking the, the inverse sine of something very small. Uh, so then theta is also going to be very small and, and sine theta and theta are roughly equal. Is, is that, I mean, I feel like as we get closer to this thing, giving you X naught, that's not going to hold anymore, right? Or So, so theta is not going to change. Um, so, yeah, so, so. Okay, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, all right. Theta, theta is always just one over square root N. Um, so it's, it's always some, some tiny little angle. Um, but as you rightly point out, we're going to do this a lot of times. OK. Um, so you know, let's, let's next step. We again, or just do it explicitly. So we flip um, t3 over the, the horizontal axis. So you give a t4 that's down here. In my case, theta was not a very small angle, so we're going to very quickly get round to, to something quite large. But we're now going to flip over the, the t1 axis. So that's going to, so this was another 2 theta. OK, and then we flip over the, whoops, the, the t1 axis. It's at time t5 after doing two iterations of, um, 
u1 u minus 1 to the f and then d we get a further angle of 2 theta around okay but it's the same same theta over as before it's not that theta is getting bigger it's just that we're applying a 2 theta rotation and then another 2 theta rotation another 2 theta rotation So if we have apply D and a U minus one to the F, K times, that ends up being a rotation by theta. Yeah, I didn't want to call this theta. Uh, by phi equals 2K over square root n. Okay, so each pair gives a, a rotation by two over square root n. We do k of them. That gives a, a rotation by by two k over square root n. It follows that if we apply this pi by four times square root n times. Okay. This obviously isn't an integer, but we could imagine doing sort of the floor or ceiling, or just round to the nearest integer. Then this will be a rotation by roughly pi by two. Okay, the reason it's only roughly is that we had to approximate pi by four times square root n times an integer. Um, but if each If each step is only only rotating by some very small angle, then you know it doesn't matter if you round up or round down. You're still going to be getting rotating by some angle that's very very close to pi by two. Um, okay. What do we get when we rotate this initial state? At time t1, round by pi by 2, well, technically, we get something like here. OK, but we're assuming theta is very, very small. Um, if, if, if big N is exponentially large in little n, and little n is at least like 10 or something, then, then you know, we can basically ignore the difference between these two angles. Um, and so we get, yeah, t. final is basically going to be in the x naught direction. OK, give me some angle very, very close to x naught. D u minus 1 to the f to the power pi by 4 from square root n. Acting on our superposition over x. is going to be roughly equal to x naught. Measure x to determine x naught. OK. Any questions about how that algorithm worked? Like the, the different steps in the process? Uh, what happens if your um, initial x is almost as it's like x not is almost as equivalent to x it's like very close to the initial x so so we're not starting with a single initial x we're starting with a superposition over all equal superposition over all values of x is that clear okay right our initial state is is written here it's a, a superposition over all values of x and we can write that as a small component in in the direction of some particular x x naught plus a large component that's orthogonal to that. So there's, like, 
there's like no chance that this superposition of x's can be equal to x not right at the start. Uh, I mean, if you measured it, you would get some probability, one over big N of, of just measuring x naught. But yeah, because it's an equal superposition, then it, it's like, as a quantum state, it, it's guaranteed to have an equal weight in each of the, the values of x, and hence, uh, including uh, x naught. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I see like the flaw in my thinking. Cool. That clear? Awesome. Thanks for the question. OK. OK. Nice. So we've succeeded. And moreover, we did so with a quadratic speed up. Yay. Okay. So <laughs> Grover search is one of those things that you know, if you had really good quantum computers that were like comparable in size, at least to your classical computers, it would be valuable. It does like give you speed ups and, and useful things that you want to do. Um, but the sort of way it's often described is not, um, yeah, the, the, the uses that people talk about are not the things it would actually be useful for. Um, so what is Grover search actually good and bad for? So it's often described as sort of a quantum version of like Googling something, right? You, you, you have some, some X naught that you want to find and it finds it for you. Um, and this is a very, very, very bad use of Grover search. Uh, so this is like database search. We, we have some, yeah, you know, we have some database of entries maybe. Uh, and we want to look up some particular entry, right? Maybe maybe our database stores like the names of all the people in this class and their age, okay? And you want to to you know, look up. You, you want to type in a name and have it spit out the age of that person, um, and you want to have it do it faster than a classical computer would be able to do, okay? So you could, in principle, use uh, Grover search to do this. So how would you do it? Well, at least the most sort of obvious way is instead of sort of having a superposition over all values of X, you would have a superposition over the entries in the database, right? So you maybe encode each pair of like someone's name and their age into a value of X. And then you have a superposition that's just over the, the entries that are actually in the database. Um, so rather than every possible combination of, of a human name and an age in there, it only has the particular names with their particular ages. And then if we did that, we could use Grover's algorithm to find item in the database. in order square root n time. Great. So why, you know, if it works, why did I say this is a bad use of, of Grover search? In fact, a completely, uh, totally useless use of Grover search. There's two reasons. The first is that we just assumed that we had this state that was a superposition over the x's in the database, right? Um, if I have some database that's like a classical database or something, and I want to load it into this quantum superposition, I'm going to have to read all the entries in the database in order to do that. Because if I haven't read my classical entry in the database or like, you know, heard heard what it is in some way, um, then I'm not going to be able to to create the superposition. There's no shortcut there. So just loading the database into that superposition. takes an order n time already. Okay, so this quadratic speed up 
is like completely useless. We don't get to take advantage of it because also the moment we've you know done one search for something, then we destroy the superposition by doing Grover's algorithm, and we'd have to load it, the database into the superposition again for the next time we want to do a search. Um, so that's pretty terrible on its own. Um, but there's another problem, which is that databases are normally highly structured objects, right? So Grover search, the power of it is letting you efficiently look through a list where you have no idea about any of the elements in the list um, and what they might be. Um, and so otherwise, you would just have to literally look at every single element of the, the list. Um, in practice, if you have some sort of database, we're not going to be complete idiots. We're going to store that database in something like listing names by alphabetical order or something like that, right? Um, and if I have names listed by alphabetical order and I have a particular name, John Smith, then I go, OK, the last name starts with S. So I'm going to start maybe checking the middle one. I'll see, OK, the middle one starts with P. Um, so I want to look after that. So now I look 3 quarters of the way along maybe find something close to S, and I can use binary search to uh, find the element I'm looking for in a logarithmic time. Um, so having a structured database allows efficient classical search anyway, um, makes Grover search doubly pointless. So Grover search is not going to replace Google with some weird quantum superposition thing. What is it useful for? It's like the good use of it. The good use of it is searching for some solution to some problem. Okay, so it is often the case that it's easy to check. Whether f of x equal to one for some function f, but hard to find such an x. Right, we've come across problems exactly like that before. Someone tell me what they are. Back in lecture seven, when we were talking about complexity classes. Yep. It's a verifier. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's problems in NP, right? Is the classic example. Problems, you know, NP complete problems, maybe problems, hard, hard problems in, in NP, but aren't known to be in P. MP complete problems just means if you can solve them, then you can solve any other efficiently, then you could solve any other problem efficiently. So they're sort of the, the hardest problems in NP. Uh, but don't worry too much about that. Just, just problems that are in NP, but not in P. Um, then what we can do is we can just try all possible solutions. And superposition. Okay, so we can we can have the different values of x represent possible different inputs to our problem, and then we can use Grover to amplify the right solution. So we start with, with 
with you know small amplitude in front of, of each of the possible solutions, each of the possible inputs. And then we use Grover search to make the uh, the amplitude in front of the um, the solution we want that has f of x equal to one bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. So this is really the the sort of classic thing, as I say, that everyone wants quantum computers to be able to do. Um, the problem is that it still takes order square root n time. Um, In particular, this means right. If your input is size n, then uh, this is order two to the little n over two. Doesn't let you solve MP problems. in polynomial time, in little n, size of the input. But it does give a quadratic speed up over exhaustive search. Right, exhaustive search just means classically try literally every possibility and, and see what you get. And that will get take two to the little n time rather than two to the little n over two. Of course, for many MP problems, um, then there are better algorithms for exhausted search. But there are ones out there, plenty of them, in fact, um, where exhaustive search is pretty much as good as anything we know. Uh, and so in that case, Grove search does, does give an improvement. And also often even these like better solutions, better algorithms, you can sort of Grover them as well and get the same sort of quadratic speed up over, over that algorithm. Okay. So just to be very explicit, um, so for example, the subset sum problem, right, we'll call that we have some set of integers want to know, and we want to know whether some subset adds up to zero. Okay. So how would we do this using so so one one algorithm you could do this for this classically. It's not the best one in this case, is but it is one, it's just to do exhaustive search. Right, you try every possible subset and you see if they add up to zero. It's quick to check whether each one, individual one adds up to zero, but it's hard to find which one might. So you have to try them all and that takes a very long time. Okay. So to, to sort of Groverize this algorithm, we would have X label all the possible subsets. I, if, some, if some digit XI equals one, then that means uh, element i is in the subset. And we would have f of x, which is some easy to implement little circuit because it's an easy to implement classical algorithm. Um, it's just the quest returns one if subset sum equals zero, zero if not. Okay. Then we just do Grover search. And in time, order two to the little n over two. returns, if there is a unique x naught, 
such that uh, um, yeah, unique subset x naught that adds up to zero, then it will return that x naught. Okay. Can anyone see a potential problem here? Oh, sorry, what did you mean when you said x label subsets? Yeah, so so x we can think of as just a set of binary bits, right? That are either one or zero. Okay. And so if some elements one, right, we we yeah. N bits where n is a uh, number of elements in the set. Okay. So if some bit xi is equal to one, that means that the element i is part of the subset that we're, we're considering. Is that clear? So if the problem was like, you have three numbers, like two, three, and five, and you want to find like the subset that the sum is eight, then like how would two? Three, yeah, so, so let's just, so let's say our elements were eight minus two, five minus three, four, zero, six. Okay, and let's say x was one, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. Then uh, that corresponds to the subset. Eight and five, okay. Eight, because eight is one, has, has one in x and five has one in x and all the others are zero. And then f of x is just the sum of x, eight and five is not equal to zero. So f of x is equal to zero. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So can, can anyone see a potential problem here? The clue is what I wrote in brackets, right? Is, there is can there, be, I mean, there could be multiple, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so potential problem. What if there's more than one solution? And you can see the details in the book of, of how Grover's algorithm works if there's more than one solution. Um, I'm just going to sort of sketch it. Uh, but basically, the point is so the superposition over all values of x, rather than splitting into sort of uh, 1 over square n times x naught and the rest, is it naturally gets split into superposition over the x's where f of x equals 1 and a superposition over the x's where f of x equals zero, right? So when we apply uf, this state, we'll call this x good and this x bad. So u minus one to the f, takes x good to minus x good, and it takes x bad to x bad, right? Um, so that's exactly the same as what happened um, when we just had a unique solution x zero uh, and the diffusion operator, obviously again, uh, preserves this state and implies a phase that preserves the, the superposition of x and applies a phase of minus one to the state orthogonal to that. So it all looks pretty similar, um, except the amplitude, the initial amplitude for the x good state depends on the number of the solutions, right? Number of solutions. 
to f of x equals one. Okay, because the amplitude is is just yeah, it's the the normalization of this state, square root of normalization of that state, and uh, that will be larger than more solutions we have. In turn, this means the rotation rate, right? How 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 much it gets rotated by in each step, like theta, um, and therefore the number of iterations you need to do to do Glover search, also depend on number of solutions. So if you try to implement Grover's algorithm thinking there's only one unique solution x naught, and there was actually two, um, then you'll have rotated, the state will have been rotating at twice the state rate you thought it was. So rather than ending up at the sort of x good in the vertical direction, it will have rotated twice as far around and ended up being uh, in the, the x bad state. And so when you measure it, you're not going to get an example of a, a solution. You're going to get an example of something that's not a solution. Okay. So this is a problem. There's two fixes to this problem, both of which work pretty well. The first is a very low tech fix, which is just try for repeatedly implement Grover's algorithm assuming different numbers of solutions each time, right? So we first do Grover's algorithm with a number of iterations that will work if there's only one solution. Then we do it if there's two solutions and so on. Okay, and this works. It's like pretty, pretty satisfying. Um, but there is also a high-tech way, a sort of fancier way to do it that is described in Riefel and Pollock. I'm not going to talk about it. But basically, the way it works is you combine Grover search with quantum, a quantum Fourier transform to actually estimate how many solutions there are. Basically, the, the, the rate at which it rotates around is determined by the number of solutions, but that's like a phase in a phase estimation problem, right? And so you can use quantum phase estimation on the sort of Grover algorithm with your unitary being the unitary used in the Grover algorithm in order to estimate the number of solutions, and then you do Grover search with that number of solutions to work out what the state actually was. OK. Um, but yeah, you know, that's, that's really not important. It's mostly a side thing. Uh, the thing you should just take away is that, that um, yeah, I'm going to get rid of that and just write more than one. So I'm not sure it was legible. The thing to take away is that the, the algorithm does generalize the case where there's more than one solution. It's just slightly more complicated to deal with if you don't know how many solutions there are. OK. Any questions about the sort of applications of Grover stuff? Awesome. OK, so the final thing so I'm going to Oh, yeah. Just a quick notational question. Yep. The um, x, b, and X is that X Q or X X X, X G? They they okay, they were that makes sense. Yeah, they're they're just yeah. a label for these these two states. That I'm I'm just using them to refer to the superposition over the the good X's where f of X equals one, and the superposition over the bad X's where f of X equals zero. Is that clear? Yeah. So the thing I'm confused about is you say the weight um, changes depending on the number of solutions, but isn't yep. it the isn't it the weight uh, it's not the weight of xg and xb, which is a sum, right? It's the weight of the individual states in that sum, isn't it? Uh, so, so, 
Yeah, so, so what matters? I was slightly unclear here about whether X, G, and X, B were the normalized states or not. Let's, let's make them be the normalized states, right? Um, so, you know, this, this actual thing here is not normalized. It's normalization is like, uh, um, so this is really like a square root G over N. Um, Ah, make XG okay. be normalized, where G is the number of, of good solutions. Uh, and this is N minus G over N, right? Where, where G is, again, the number of, of things that have F of X equal one, right? So you, yeah, you need those sense. factors there to make XB and XG be normalized. And then, yeah, when we come to do, you know, we have an XB axis and we have an XG axis then our starting state is now, theta is now bigger than it was before, right? Yeah. So it's uh, square root g of n. Okay, is that clear? Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so the final thing I just want to talk about briefly is you know, this theorem that came about before Grover that fits very, very nicely with it, uh, which is basically showing that you can't do better than Grover search does. Um, so any algorithm will need it. This for, 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 you know, in the black box setting where we have this U minus one to the F, but we're, we're just allowed to call it and we don't know anything else about how it works. Um, then, then we can't do better than order square of N calls. And in fact, even the pi by four, is known to be optimal. So Grover's algorithm is really as efficient as it possibly could be. Um, so I'm not going to make any pretense to being careful or rigorous with this proof, um, but you certainly can be. It's not too much harder. Uh, so if you want to see how it's done properly, it just involves mentioning the words Cauchy-Schwarz inequality a few more times than I will, um, then it's done in section 9.3 of Reform Pollock. OK. Okay, so how it works is we imagine that we just have some general circuit on an arbitrary number of qubits um, that is meant to solve, solve this Grover search problem, right? We don't know anything about how it works, uh, but you know, we know that it maybe applies. You can always make it start in the zero state, that's fine. Um, then maybe it applies some unitary, U1, okay? And then maybe at some point it does its first call to U minus one to the F, right? Um, but the point is that this U1, you know, because it's not allowed to know anything about F except for, uh, except for, for by using the calls to U minus one to the F, this U1 is just you know, some fixed unitary that's just a fixed thing in the algorithm. Then maybe it applies some second unitary, U2, and then it calls U minus one to the F again, U3. Okay. And then eventually it has a final, like UK, U minus one to the F. And then this gives us a state that I'll call psi K x naught, okay? So it depends on k, because you get a different state depending on like when in the process we stop. And it depends on x naught only depends on x naught through the calls to u minus one to the f, right? So we're, we're trying to work, have, find an algorithm that works for any x naught. Um, so this sort of u1 and u2, all these steps in the algorithm can't depend on what f, x naught is. The only thing that depends on x naught is, is the fact that you're calling u minus one to the f for an f that has f of x naught equal one and everything else theory. Okay. At the end, of the whole process, we need to learn X naught by 
by doing a measurement. This means that if we have any x naught and x naught prime that are different, then the inner product of psi if we used x naught and psi if we used x naught prime needs to be very small. Right? It doesn't have to be exactly zero because the measurement, you know, we only have to learn x naught with high probability. Um, but uh, yeah, for all, whenever these two things are distinct, they need to be able to be distinguished by measurement, and that means that they have to be close to orthogonal. If they're not, if they're, their overlap is pretty big, if they're pretty similar states, there's no way that a measurement is going to be able to distinguish them. Okay. So well, we're going to prove. Meaning, yep. Sorry, is the meaning of this inner product you have some function f and some function f prime with two different exactly? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So so f here. Assuming f naught x naught equals one, f of x naught equal to x naught is equal to zero. Okay, so f depends on x naught, and in this case, we're we're using two different f's, one of which uses x naught and one of which uses x naught prime. Okay, and we to to accurately learn x naught in one case from our measurement and x naught prime from our measurement in the other case then they need to be close to orthogonal states because otherwise the measurement will give them the same outcome most of the time. Okay. Okay. So we're going to find a new state that I'm just going to call psi k, which is just going to be the whole circuit without any u minus ones to the f's put in there at all. Right. So we just do the same circuit, but we don't you know, it's imagining there just like isn't any x naught. Um, and so u minus one to the f just doesn't do anything. Okay. So in particular, psi one is just equal to u one naught. And we can write that. So it's important to remember in Grover, we didn't have any extra qubits. Like the, the only qubits we really used were the, the ones describing x. But in general algorithm, you could have more. Um, so this, this zero could be on a very large number of qubits. Uh, but we can always expand this state as um, some numbers that for each x times the state x times some state that I'll call psi subscript x of all the extra qubits that we're not going to use uh, when we, that, that are not going to be affected by our u minus one to the f. Okay. So this is just a general expansion that is valid for any quantum state. And then we can write down psi one x naught. It's just u minus one to the f of psi one without the u minus one to the f. And all that gets changed here is that c1 x naught goes to c1, sorry, minus, goes to minus c1 x naught, right? It gets, a, it gets its phase flipped. So this just goes to the same psi one minus two times c1 x naught, x naught plus whatever the extra qubits are in if uh, the qubits we're, we're using are in x naught. Okay. These c one x is squared all have to add up to one because the state is normalized. So for an average, and this algorithm needs to work for any x naught. So on average, C1x is order square root one over n. Hence, for typical values of x naught, not necessarily for all x naughts, but for, for average ones, 
And again, the algorithm needs to work for any x naught, so, so we can think about the average ones. Then this state is just psi 1 plus something that's like order 1 over square root n. Okay? The only thing that got changed was this little part of the state. And in general, that will be very small. So applying this u minus 1 to the f hasn't really changed the state very much at all. Okay. What about after k steps? So that was just one step, but we can call u minus 1 to the f multiple times. Well, at each step, we can have the same sort of like, you know, applying the u minus 1 to the f can create the same order 1 over square root n change in the state. So after k steps, we find that this k psi k x naught is equal to what it would be if we didn't apply any u minus 1 to the f's plus or minus some order k over square root of n correction, right? The, 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 all the little changes just add up linearly with the number of times we can apply u minus 1 to the f. OK. It follows that if we have two things, psi x naught and psi k x prime naught, then their inner product is just the inner product of psi k with itself plus corrections that are order k over square root n. OK. This thing is just a normalized state. So it's 1. The inner product with itself is 1. So there's 1 minus some order k over square root n correction. Again, these are for sort of typical or average, really, values of x0 and x0 prime. Um, so to be actually careful about like the fact that we're averaging these things and so on, we need to do a little bit more work, but it's, it's not terribly much more work. Um, and the conclusion is that if k is much smaller than square root n, then the inner product of these two states is necessarily close to 1. And they can't be distinguished by measurement. With some more care, being a bit more careful with actually proving things about the averages and stuff and, and you know, using Cauchy-Schwarz inequality a few times, I encourage you to read it in the book. It's a, a nice little proof, just one you don't have time to do in detail. You can show that k is actually greater than or equal to roughly pi by 4 square root n. So Grover really is optimal. The lower bound is very tight. We even get the, const the, the coefficient in front, right? Um, OK. So that is all we're going to cover today. Does anyone have any questions about the optimality of Grover search stuff or anything else from the lecture? I had a quick question. Yep. You were saying that on average, the the c1 x uh x not phi x not is just one over root n is that is that just because we're saying on average it'll only be one solution to f uh no 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 this has nothing to do with the number of solutions to f um oh yeah i i i have assumed here that we only have one solution to f but uh, so th there's just one x naught that's being changed um but the reason that each individual c1 x is on average one over square root n is that just that there's n different values of x, right? And so uh, the whole state is normalized. So that means the sum over x uh, modulus of c1x squared has to be equal to 1. Um, 
And this implies, you know, the expectation of any particular C1x squared is equal to 1 over n. OK. Is that clear? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, I'm kind of curious how, like, when you have this unitary of minus 1 to the f, how you just, like, make that unitary in the first place because it seems like say for the sum of integers problem you kind of have to know what numbers you're dealing with at first yeah. place to make yep. it so, yeah yeah that, that's a very good question so so the f you have here will for the the uh subset some problem it, it will be a different f depending on what the integers are okay um so you, you need to construct your f of x depending on the integers are. But that's fine because there's only little n integers. And the algorithm is taking exponentially longer than that. So you have plenty of time to, to read all the different integers and define a circuit. So the, the way you would do this in practice is you first define a uf that takes uh, x and an extra bit y um, to x, y plus f of x, right? That flips y, even only if um, the integers add up to zero. Okay, you know, there's, there's, it's easy to construct once you know what the integers are, some classical logic gate circuit that will implement f of x. And by our general arguments a few lectures ago, that in turn allows us to implement a, a quantum u of f that does exactly this, okay? And then you can just apply uf, x, and the minus state. And that goes to minus 1 to the f of x, x minus. So that is exactly the, the yeah, this is implementing the, the, the exactly the unitary to x that we want to implement. So would it take like log big n time to make this unitary? At least, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so when I said that the time is, yeah, so implementing uf is going to take a time that grows polynomially in little n. So let me um, correct this to, I was a bit sloppy. I should have had some polynomial in n out the front. Okay, okay. cool. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? I think there was a question in the chat. Ah. Can I use Brown for the efficiency in other problems? Um, OK, so, so the question in the chat is whether you can use similar arguments to find bounds for the efficiency of other problems. Um, in general, when you have a uh, oracle, you can use arguments like this to, to, to low bound um, complexities, query complexities, reasonably easy, like arguments along these lines. And certainly this is the style of argument that you could use. Uh, the really hard thing to find low bounds for is stuff where there isn't an oracle and it's just an actual problem, like you know, solve the subset sum problem, right? Like the, the, cause there's just so many possible ways you could imagine constructing an algorithm for doing that that are so specific to the problem. Um, whereas, yeah, uh, yeah, something with a black box, then you know the sort of only way you can learn about it is by applying that unitary that depends on the, the depends on F. And so you can have much more control over for what's possible and what's not. Um, yeah. Uh, is that clear? Yes. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So, um, I think we will leave it here in a minute. Uh, so that is actually the end of our sort of quantum algorithms section of the course. Um, so next time we're going to start moving in a more information-y quantum information direction, like real quantum information as opposed to quantum computing. Um, and in particular, uh, we're going to introduce the idea of density matrices and, and mixed quantum states, which are really the right way to think about quantum states all the time. Uh, it's just when you're thinking about algorithms, it happens that you can sort of avoid talking about them for a while. But uh, yeah, so we're going to be going back towards like pure quantum mechanics formalism stuff um, 
they're very neat and cool and exciting. So yeah, come along on Tuesday. Look forward to it. Uh, okay, let me stop the recording.